All right, we dancing. Welcome to the winner's circle. I'm so excited to have um, our guest on today and let me introduce him to you. So on this episode of Welcome to the Winner's Circle, we interview Onnit, Chief Fitness Officer, who oversees all training at Onnit and the Onnit Academy. He's been instrumental in designing all Onnit Academy certifications, as well as Onnit 6 and the Onnit Facebook Tribe. Before becoming Chief Fitness Officer for Onnit, he founded and owned Wolf Fitness Systems, a well-known unconventional gym in California, a veteran of functional unconventional training who learned from legends such as Pat, Pavel Tatsulin and Sh Scott Sonnen. He teaches around the world and has worked with celebrities and elite athletes such as comedian Joe Rogan, UFC fighter Carlos Condit, and NHL star Duncan Keith. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to John Wolf. Welcome to the Winter Circle. Wow, you know, after that kind of intro, I feel like I got to dance in the winner circle. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm already dancing. See, um, but thank you, thank you for having me here with you, and uh, you know, so excited to be here. Uh, given being able to be part of your journey, Derek, and and ho hopefully continue to support the amazing work that you that you do in all of all the different capacities. You know. Absolutely. Thank you, John. And you actually are one of the inspirations behind the title, Welcome to the Winter Circle. And I don't know if you will remember where that came from, but um, it goes back to when we filmed um, on an Academy, the foundations, the training back in January 2019, and we did the, the dinner at Hideaway, and Sean Powers was up, and he said, he had a table there, and he says, this is the winner's table, put your glass down. And you were the first one to put your glass down and I went right up and put mine on there as well. And um, the concept of welcome to the winner circle is anyone can be a winner. Um, so often we put others on pedestals um, when, because we're not willing to do the work to put ourselves in, in their shoes, but we're, we're all on the hero's journey and we can all be a winner and that's a choice we can all choose to make. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, that was a really special, uh, handful of days uh just the the group of people that we were able to to pull together to to try to, to try to demonstrate to those people who will be taking our education virtually what, what it feels like to be part of our our community you know to, to emulate a more live delivery through a virtual means uh, because so much of what we try to do is is have that that human element and that connectivity and and to hear that that some of the experiences, not necessarily in the filming, but even supplemental, a lot of the experiences we try to create were, were those, those dinners and the, and the storytelling that we all did, the time we shared uh, as a tribe at Hideaway and, and wherever else the, the nights had taken us, right? At, at, as we continued to try to get as much sleep as we could to get ready for the next day. But, um, but that's so great to know that I, did, I didn't realize that some of the experiences of, of one of those evenings it led to influencing at least the title in some way shape or form of your of your project yeah absolutely and not only the title of this podcast but um that whole weekend actually inspired my the hero project initiative which i know you're very familiar with um it was created that weekend with carmen morgan shane hines natalie higby and just conversations with everyone um that weekend and I had a meeting the next day when I got back to Winnipeg um, with the school division. They wanted me to propose a program. And I created that program that weekend. I had kind of an outline. And yeah, that, that weekend inspired the Hero Project, which is still running strong today. And you and Shane were talking about it on one of your Facebook Lives, which led to me um, being teaching this in a school in Monet now um, and teaching this digitally all over this Canada and the United States. So um, that weekend was really monumental for me. And I know a lot of others involved. So I really want to thank you for that, John, and your support yeah. with that Hero Project. Man, you know, you, you, it's hard not to get uh, excited about people that we're lucky to, to have in our circle, right? You know, and, and that vibe of our tribe, it is, it is a winning vibe. And it is, it is a function of choice. It is a function of being uh, in a state of, of perpetual gratitude in action towards greater service and you know you you really held that mantle so uh thank you 
Yeah, thank you for, for letting me be part of, uh, of, of your journey, your hero's journey. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this podcast was also inspired by Eric Godsey, who recommended me to create some sort of Zoom call, um, some sort of Zoom um, podcast or group, group chat for his Go For Your Win 3 group. Um, to me, going for your win means enjoying the process. Um, we live in a society where we're very destination oriented. When I get this job or when I get this um, relationship or when I get this car, when I get this, this, this degree, um, I'll be happy. Whereas it's really the process where all the sweetness lies. Um, so that's what going for your win means to me, valuing the process over the destination. What does going for your win mean to you, John? And what does going for your win look like for you today? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's really interesting because, you know, I think we've all, we've all lived that externalized reality of, of validation, right? Like, oh, when I attain this, when I have this type of person as a mate, when I have this kind of vehicle I drive, when I attain this title that are, or, you know, in, in many of those, they're, they're relatively arbitrary, you know, and fleeting in their ability to fulfill any desire you have. You know, you, you get the car you want and it's really exciting for a couple of days, you know, maybe a couple of weeks, you know, and, you know, um, and then you may fantasize about who someone is relative to you. But when, if you enter into a, a more intimate dynamic, you know, you realize it's always work. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's this uh, candy coated reality that there's always, as you said, there's always a process to be in. And, and, um, and, and I really like that, that acknowledgement. So for me, like passionately per pursuing your purpose and accepting the reality that the only thing that we have as a responsibility and an obligation is to make the best choices we can given what's available to us and, and, and somewhat detaching from a specific outcome as a result, because you get the right to make the choice, but there are a lot of external variables that, that may steer the course more right than what you can even envision. And, and if you're not willing to enjoy the process of even the hardships that may come from some of those choices, uh, I was just talking to my wife about this, is being principled doesn't mean that you won't pay a price, that, that things will be fair from your perspective. It, quite often it's the contrary. It usually means that you're willing to pay the price of being a principled, well-principled person. And, and I think that that goes back to that concept of like, you know, I'm coaching my 12 year old son and saying like, son, you know, you have just the opportunity to make the choice that you make. You only get to make it now. And whatever the outcome is, you know, you have to be okay with the outcomes that are derived of those choices. And that in itself is, is fulfilling, you know, like to be settled, to be okay, because even if it doesn't turn out well, I made the best choice I could and I honor that in me. I honor that, that moment and that decision. And then, you know, learning to roll with it and, and celebrate even what seems like maybe not the intended or ideal outcomes that come as a result, but often, and I think you probably can speak to this as well as anybody else. So many treasures come from those un unintended and often unwanted circumstances that we find ourselves in. And uh, if you can't do that, if you can't be okay with accepting that that's part of the reality that we're going to constantly live in, it, it's really hard to feel like you're going for your win on a daily basis, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, but when your purpose is aligned with the choices you make and, and your character is a function of, uh, you know, a reflection of that, then you know, the character that you see yourself as, you know, the, the, the one, the one, the one that you're manifesting, um, then, then everything else is okay. And, and, and even when it's hard, you're still winning, you know? Absolutely. So one big thing that um, we learn in the go for your win course is in this, the, the first chapter, the first thing we need to set. And for the listeners, if you aren't clear on this, I suggest you begin that process and there's no better time to start anything than the right here, the right now. So I asked this question to you, John, 
what is your mission? What is your mission here on this earth plane, this reality field? Oh man, you know, I, I uh, my, my personal experience, my human experience is, it, it's been really blessed, right? And so um, I've had plenty of hardship in, on the road. Mm that has largely been self-imposed, I've realized, you know, as a result of, of getting through it. And, and, and um, I'm really, like, lucky to find myself in a position to positively influence other human beings to realize that, that they have not only the right, but the responsibility and the power to, to take control of their story right and and that and the vehicle for me to 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 elicit that outcome is largely through through fitness which is this this highly accessible thing in this very tangible plane of the physical plane where we can interact with what's around us and in doing so in in space and 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 like building a framework of successes and confidence and competence that that usually can translate so effectively to those more ethereal planes of mental, emotional, spiritual type of concepts, right? So I get to be a platform through, through our teachings and through what we offer uh, for people to further their studies and realize their greater potentials. And, you know, I think that's what really attracted me to on it is like, I don't, I'm certainly not the, the guy at the top of the mountain, but I, I'd like to be the guide that gets you safely up, up as far as we can go together, you know, and, uh, and really hope to continue finding inspiration in, in each of the unique paths that, that, that those people I shared some of that journey would take thereafter. Mm -hmm. So I feel that um, one thing people often don't do is they don't celebrate their wins. They don't celebrate their successes. So I'd like to give you a moment to do just that. What are some wins, what are some um, successes you'd like to celebrate and that you are most proud of on your journey this far, John? Um, you know, I think uh, if, if, if it was like one of the ones that, I, that I've always drawn a lot of strength from is, is overcoming my, my previous chemical addiction. I guess when you, they say, you know, a lot of people would say like, well, if you're, you're an addict at one time, you're always an addict, right? And so, you know, I don't, I don't associate myself that way, but, but I, I did, I was a 130 pound methamphetamine addict and, and to overcome that place in my life to be, um, to take those lessons and to apply them in a positive framework, right. To, to be more human and more relatable and more understandable of the fallible nature of each of us, um, and relate to anybody wherever they are in the journey because probably, you know, my rock bottom was just as bad or, or, or deeper or darker than as, as many. And so, you know, I, I think it really provided me more human perspective to, to provide better coaching, better support for other people. But, you know, in a more like professional standpoint, like, um, like being able to design and deliver an education framework that and, and help, help nurture a community that does what you said. On, on the call uh, to acknowledge that the power of that um, can translate into things like this and, and your other, you know, projects. And, and to be part of that in some way, shape or form is a, such a, such a huge win. They're, they're not my wins, but like, it's almost like, you know, a lineage to some degree, but it's not like mine, you know, it's not like, it's like, I, I feel like one of the things I really think is really important for teachers to accept is if you teach something, it's like giving a gift, right? Like it's not up to me how you use that gift. To be honest, that's such a limiting perspective when teachers teach you and tell you how you have to, how you have to be to be right within that, that teaching within that gift. I think a good teacher is, is providing something that is now yours and to see what you do with it is, is a reward in itself. Um, and then more recently within on it we we are about to launch our sixth and last planned edition of our on it six home fitness product line and uh 
and it's been a couple of years in the making. So I, I really, I really find that that's, that brings a sense of fulfillment because it's, it's something that's come full circle, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that holds people back from pursuing their win um, and for achieving these amazing successes that you've had um, is fear. And that's the number one thing that holds people back in my opinion. How have you overcome fear? And can you maybe give an example of where you felt fear and what you did, what you did about it? Man, you know, when I was a, a small business owner, I was afraid almost every month that I wouldn't have the money to pay payroll and rent and keep the electricity on. And, and there were many times where, where that was a reality that days before those things were due, the obligations outweighed the ability to fulfill them. And, 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 every time, not more times than not, every time, there was always a matter of, of like universal writing or, you know, like uh, like signs and, and, and passionately pursuing like the path towards a solution that did, I didn't know existed that would kind of make everything all right. And so I'd have to say in that state, I was more constantly stressed about what could or could couldn't happen that would like dissolve what it was that was trying to be fight to live right i mean it's almost like everything with life is like there's a, a constant battle just to survive and then thrive right and 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 then and then the the imposter syndrome that comes when you elevate your perceived status and and and, and have people that you admire and respect look to you as a source of valid information you know like um i don't have a formalized education in in movement sciences or fitness my my education has been through the practical application of the unique systems that we have amalgamated and now teach and so so for a long time i think that you know those things um you know the financial scarcity of, which was a reality at the time, at least until I created the abundance mindset that would overcome it, but that would come in this cycle. And then, and then the, um, and then the self doubt of, of, of my was worthiness to be in the position that I found myself in as a leader here at on it has certainly been something that, that, you know, had kept me up at night or, or maybe question question you know if i'm giving enough or doing enough right and and um and thankfully i both in both cases uh, i get so much positive reinforcement you know just the met the conversation today tells me i'm doing what i'm supposed to be doing you know and that that i'm lucky to be here even as i face those doubts and they they i think they come up when you're going for your win, they come up perpetually at, at some cadence, hopefully you're in a reduced cadence as time goes on. But, but I think whenever you're overwhelmed, you're overcoming a, a newer and greater challenge, which I think that's part of going for your win is that, you, you know, you, you're never keeping it easy. You're going to go, your next win is bigger than the win that you've already acclimated to. And, and, and it's natural to find yourself in that state again, you know, and, and have to, temper your resolve and have faith in in what you've already established as as a a, a winning mentality and a, and a set of tools and resources and faith in yourself as well and in the universe right yeah it's interesting that you talked about the imposter syndrome um i personally i've been asked that a few times by um various listeners of ours and it's not something i really relate to when i encounter that I acknowledge it and I keep on moving forward so how what would you advise someone um encountering imposter syndrome how do you recommend they overcome it I just don't feel qualified um, to give them a, qual a good answer I mean I think that you hit the nail on the head it, it it's just noise right like yeah. who are you to tell you what you're creating your vehicle you're a you know you're there as a conduit you know, like, like there, you have a, 
you, there's a reason you're called to do the work you're doing, don't be the limiting factor to its opportunity to manifest greatness, right? Like, like that you're in a pos unique position. Everything is lined up for for this to turn out to be something that you might not even imagine in terms of its impact and greatness. And 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 to you know, like if Stephen Pressfield would call it the resistance, right? The, the war of art. And, and and it's natural to find yourself butted up against this resistance. The greater the work, the greater the resistance. But but that that is realistically the the key is is like what they say say if you find yourself uh, going through hell, just keep going, right? Like if if you're in this state of of perpetual torment and stress, like well, don't stay there. Keep moving until you find you know the sliver of light and then walk through that light because at the end is, is something that's really worthwhile and um i've never found that not to be true so at this point in time yeah if the noise shows up and i'm just like you like yeah well i don't really give into that because you know getting 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 to the end and having something to offer is more important than whatever my beliefs are Absolutely. I think Joseph Campbell says um, when you, it's something like when you go into um, that place of dark, like the cave you fear to enter is where all the treasure lay. So when you feel that fear, acknowledge it and then keep moving forward. Um, and that's something that I sh do, with, do with my life. Um, you mentioned Stephen Pressfield, which is interesting. I really love it, all his books. And that's one of the questions we have um, about resistance. Resistance is something that will always come up again and again and again forever how do you attend to resistance john you know there's, there's a variety of different things that in the most pressing the most um real way um it's important to acknowledge what what your attachments are right so like i think that's where a lot of this resistance comes is, and aubrey had recently posted is, is is you i'm sure see like there's like your current state, your current ego state, right? It is, is a, has a life of its own. And even if, even if you're on the path to manifesting a higher state, like this self has to die to manifest this self, right? And uh, that's scary, right? And so, so like for me, I think a big part of, of, of that for me in the more recent years had been um, accepting the choice of, of, and accepting the, the reality that, you know, I'm a divorcee, that, that, that dissolution of that relationship wasn't a function of my deservedness of a healthy, you know, and loving relationship. And because that was the noise I was getting in the resistance, like, am I capable? Am I worthy? Again, right? It is the stories um, uh, to, to do this better and do it right you know, in line with my, my values and, and my beliefs, or do I, or am I inherently broken and not able to, to, to do it that way, you know? And so um, it was actually, and, and aligned with, again, a lot of what Aubrey might speak to, um, it was actually a psychedelic journey that helped remove that obstacle and perspective uh, with some intention set in a, in a, in a circle that was really safe. Um, you know, there were some intention sets some cards that kind of were like, well, oh, why would I pull that? What does that mean, the symbolism of that? And then a really introspective journey that removed that, uh, removed that self-judgment in, in a handful of hours of, of time in my subconscious, right? Like of seeing myself differently, actually, as a, as a, um, a creator of worlds to some extent, and, and one that, um, the other thing was like the, the changing of, of seasons. There's new growth, not only, not only in me, but around me. Right. And so, um, you know, I can't, uh, can't overlook the power of some facilitated experiences, whether, whether someone resonates with that particular path or others, there's so many things that, that, uh, empower us that are processes, like you had said, that, that could be breath work or a variety of other things that help us tap into and align our conscious and subconscious realities. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of times 
dissolve some of those layers of resistance in the process. Mm -hmm. There's, there's so many tools that we have to access. Um, psychedelics is one of them and more and more in information research is coming out. Michael T Pollan wrote a really great book um, about how to use psychedelics to cure depression and PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, what is your view on psychedelics? I think, you know, just like any other tool, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of media about, you know, gun violence and things like that. But, you know, our, our country was founded on uh, a revolution that utilized that very tool to earn our freedom. Right. And we celebrated every 4th of July. Right. So at Independence Day, we had a fight to earn our independence. Um, it was a great tool at that point in time. And now it's this, the tool that, you know, inherently drives fear because of the misuse of that tool. Uh, I think psychedelics are a very, very similar thing. Like, I think most people's experience of what they envision psychedelics are, are a misuse, not even tool, but a distraction of from the reality that we coexist in. And, and the reality is quite the opposite if used appropriately and in, in a responsible way. You know, I, my earlier experiences with them were not that. And, and I was so thankful to have this very different experience in my adult state where I had more noise I had to work through than when I was in my youth, just kind of exploring and experimenting. And, um, you know, I can only speak to my own experience, but I think post post divorce, I was in a state of post traumatic stress, and that 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 projection of of what that meant to be that because of my overly romanticized upbringing and nature, you know, like you know, it was never something I could imagine. It was a huge failure in so many ways. Now my daughter wouldn't be proximal to me on a daily basis. I was a child of divorce and was, was not with my father most of the time, many, many years, we wouldn't see each other very much. So, so those were all failures that were very hard to deal with. And, and I think that that all caused a state of stress and trauma that, that was really, really um, having a negative impact on me as a human being. And, and, and it, I couldn't imagine such a positive outcome so quickly and powerfully. But shortly after this experience, I not only didn't associate those things with myself, I, I was able to manifest a positive outcome in the sense that I met my now current wife, who I have an 18 month old child with, and a 12 year old a boy that, that preceded my, my entrance into to that relationship, who's my wholeheartedly my son. And, and we have an integrated family when my daughter can be present, you know, that's not a, a fractured reality. And so, you know, I think I can't give all the, the credit to the psychedelic. It's, it's a will, willingness and a willfulness to manifest those things in myself, but to remove the obstacle uh, I was facing, to be ready to, to, to be able to manifest these things. I think it was a, very, very, very powerful tool for me. And so that would be the message that I, that I could share. And, and, and to do so, if you, anybody's exploring um, the possibility of utilization, to, to do so in good faith, do some study, make sure you um, understand the implications like the, the Mayo Clinic and, and, and John, Hop so John Hopkins, right? They did a ton of research on psilocybin and uh, they had a protocol and, and it's always facilitated. And so like that, that would be my suggestion is like, you know, if you're going to have the tool, if you, if you're going to learn to use a firearm, it's good to get some instruction. You know, if, if th these are powerful tools that, that can be misused and, um, and have great potential to be of service at the same time. So got to pay a lot of respect to them. Absolutely. And again, it's just a tool. Um, you could use psychedelics, you could use breath work, you could use yoga, you could use whatever mindfulness. Mindfulness. <laughs> but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's you. So like the psychedelics didn't save your life. The yoga, I used to think yoga saved my life. No, at the end of the day, I saved my life. I kept on moving forward. You kept on choosing to see the light. So at the end of the day, no matter what tool we use, it's us. It's us that wields choice and creates change.
yeah, just like the great weapons that are gifted to the hero on their journey, the tools that that are presented to them, whether it's Perseus's, uh, you know, the mirrored shield or the sword, right? You know, like that we're gifted these tools, but we still have to wield them. And I think that's something you had said um, with responsibility and purpose, you know, and, and I think that, and that's the key, right? It goes back to that alignment um, and, and acknowledgement of, of what and who you are, you know, at, at, at your core. Absolutely. And um, it begins, it begins with awareness. Uh, it begins yeah, with definitely. awareness, right? Creating awareness. And with awareness comes choice. And with choice comes opportunity for great change. And with that change comes a responsibility to wield that um, because we are omnipowerful. And that's something so one of our guests, Steve Maxwell, has helped taught me. And you mentioned a few things about the abundant mindset and manifestation. Um, Steve got me on a book, um, The Complete Works by Florence Scovel Shin, that really talks about the abundance mindset. So let's talk about the abundance mindset and manifestation, um, which you mentioned both. How did you develop an abundant mindset on your journey? You know, um, I think I was always a dreamer, right? You know, like what could happen? Maybe this is, and I think a lot of people, they dream and their dreams that they choose to have are worry filled, you know? And, and, and it's tough because that inevitably leads to a life that's full of those types of stressors manifesting themselves in, in their reality, whether it's real or not, it's not a function, it's a subjective reality we live in, right? Like, like you are writing, like Joe Rogan was like, be the hero of your own journey. Like you're the, you're like the writer, producer, director, act, lead actor, and, you know, and supporting cast in many ways of your own story. Right. And so it, it, it's so interesting to me. Uh, and I think it's so outside the scope of, uh, well, so many people I love even their reality to accept that that is the choice that they're making. And I've just, I just have always been, a, I wonder how good it could be, right? Um, I think, uh, was it Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock? There was a skit where like, oh, um, people walking through a neighborhood and like, a, like I, I hope they, I hope they don't notice us, you know, or I hope, like, I hope they don't start any problems. And then, and then there's like, I wish he would start a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like the different mindset of feeling potentially victimized versus potentially empowered to deal with whatever it is that that would that it might be, right? And so, like, what if I face this huge challenge and I overcome it, right? And um, I think uh, Mark England, were you at the seminar where Mark did a little presentation on language? No, unfor oh, no, unfortunately I a, not. I was there with Alan Stein Jr. We just had him on last week. And, uh, oh, and Alan's Mark. awesome. Yeah. Alan's awesome. Uh, Mark England did a little language class, and it, and it has to do with uh, the language we speak to ourselves in and the framework with which the language that, that we use, just like that example I use is a, a part of a comedy skit, changes the dynamic of how we see ourselves as a as cast in this this play right like i hope they don't versus i wish they would you know is a very different thing and that's just one example of many of how we could see ourselves relative to the very same stimulus right and so mm -hmm. I, I i i'm a more i wish i wish it would like whatever the problems are man you know we live in a scary time right now and 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 uh, as much as, as there's uncertainty, you know, I choose to believe and with every cell in my being that everything is going to be just fine. And it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it'll be the way it, it needs to be. You know? Absolutely. I agree. So um, let's talk about relationships. Um, we'll start with romantic relationships and then we'll talk about um, relationships with your team, 
and those that you work closely. So let's start about romantic relationships. What did you learn from your divorce um, that you now apply in your current, your current marriage? I think, wow, if we're talking about that relationship and many of the, the team relationships that, that started out as some of my, my closer friendships, it really is about something that I lack the ability to do very well um, in my earlier life, you know, earlier three decades of life, I should say, which is, is, is setting boundaries, clearly communicating those boundaries and reinforcing them regularly. You know, I've, I've been a, a older sibling and parent and, and I've done that really well in those roles. But with these intimate relationships and best friends and, and confidants are, are intimate relationships. They understand you, know you. Uh, you know, I think I was always an enabler or had hero syndrome. I wanted to solve everybody's problems. And in doing so, I created this codependency that that really, I think more than anything, I, I'm just as to blame to, for the dissolution of those relationships because I set a parameter an expectation of self and them that this is the perpetual reality we can coexist in and it's not, right? Like it, it, I, I re revolted from that, that rhythm at one point in time when I realized and recognized it, but the established reality was so strong defined in those dynamics that that it wasn't necessarily something that someone else was going to be willing to change just because I decided it was time and and I, I think I realized that in retrospect you know that um, I'm just as culpable as any of those other parties and and unfortunately you know I think we were all hurting that I don't know I don't know that they necessarily still see that reality the way that I just explained it, you know? And, and I, I'm sure, you know, their stories, as I've heard from third parties, uh, I'm cast as a very different villain. And, and I, I'm trying to be as open and honest about my role, but I've never been someone who's spiteful nor wished any of those people any harm. It's just, I think sometimes as we learn and we go through these processes, um, not only relationships, but life itself is, is full of pain. And it wasn't, and, and sometimes that's just the byproduct of living, you know? And so mm -hmm. I'm sorry for, you know, I'm sorry for any of those experiences I, I am responsible for in the, in the, in their stories. But, but at the same time, you know, moving forward is I'm focused on where I am and the relationships that I have and choose to maintain now, you know, and, and, I'm no longer part of those stories as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. How do you set boundaries? What is a strategy on setting good boundaries? I feel that's really important, both in intimate relationships and professional relationships. I think you have to learn a lot about yourself to do it right. I think it's, it's really hard to expect yourself, expect to know yourself uh, really even until you have a certain level of experience, right? Um, and I've walked many different paths to determine what it is that, that, uh, that what my expectations of self and others are within any relationship dynamic that, that I'm part of. And, and I'm still learning, right? And so the reality is the, the, to be on that journey with that constant inquisitive mindset of what your beliefs are and how much they've evolved and what it is that you define as the, the, the most pressing part of, of your belief system as far as relationship dynamics are. And there's going to be different good people with very different relationship dynamic expectations, right? You know, like, and, and, and you have to be willing, first and foremost, to accept that just because someone's a good person or just because someone, you want to see value in someone, that the, a lack of alignment in those critical deal breaker kind of concepts is, are exact, they need to be exactly that, you know, like you only have a finite amount of time and energy, even in an abundance mindset to invest in so many intimate relationships, right? Like, like that is one of those things you have to manage a little bit more, you know, it, it, as a parent now, I, I see it even more clearly, like ultimately I'm responsible for the, 
the the people that are in my household to the greatest degree, the family beyond that, the chosen family and friends network. How big can that get? It can get really big really fast if you're at the um, if you're beholden to too much. How much can you invest in in, in those in those concentric circles, right? And and how mm-hmm. can you define those? I, I think it, it changes over time, but you have to be you have to try to be learning day in and day out about yourself enough to define those things and be able to learn how to communicate them honestly, um, which is hard, which is mm-hmm. really hard. I think that there are many years that had gone by where I was evolving, but I didn't allow my perspective to be known as it was changing. And then there was this huge pain point of this huge change, this huge shift that manifested in seemingly in a moment for people around me. And, and, um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think, I think that's tough. Uh, uh, somebody had said that, uh, the, in, in all lifelong relationships, the, 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 the contract always has to be changing, right? Like the contracts always, the, the agreements realistically, right? The agreements always have to be dynamic to some degree. Um, and, uh, I think that that's, that's something that, uh, it's not easy to manage, but it's something that if you want to have lifelong relationships, it's really an important part of it. Absolutely. And you manage many relationships. Can you give us an example of um, one time where you, there was a rift in a relationship and how you successfully mended that rift? <laughs> yeah, I like this story. Um, I got to on it and there was an established culture, you know, uh, there was established leadership culture in fitness already. Juan Leha, who's still here and is a is a manimal, a beast of of men, you know, and and, and a beast in that sense of like a grand of body and and big of heart as well, you know. Um, and I think that you know there was a, a a rift naturally occurring because of the person who brought me in and recruited me to on it that had a cultural divide between him and many of the other people that are already established. And I came in as his guy, right? And so reinforcing beliefs that I already had, and those things were disparate from what Juan had brought in terms of value to the table, seemed like we were at direct odds with each other and we were played to that role, right? Almost. And eventually, I remember one day walking through the gym and, and talking to, so like, hey Juan, how are you doing? He's like, man, I'm not, I'm good. I'm 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 over it. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, I don't think I want to be here anymore. You know, I was like, wait, wait, what are you talking about? It just hit me so hard that I was much partially and, and much responsible for the way he felt. And I was like, wait, he's like, no, you know, I don't really feel like I'm I have any anybody values me here. You know, and I feel like you and, and, you know, the other leadership that brought me in, you know, had, had made sure to contribute to that sensation, you know, that feeling. And I was like, man, you know, if that's how you feel in a moment, thank, I was so thankful to be, rec- to be able to recognize my responsibility, my culpability in that. And then to, to, to take enough responsibility to take action immediately because I was like, wait, hold on. If, if that's how you feel, then... I I really need to hear you out. And it was hard because he was emotionally charged and, and he's a big dude that, you know, might, might be able to do some damage really fast. You know? and, and, and I had to make myself vulnerable to hear him out in the state, but also to diffuse, diffuse the energy that was present and that I unconsciously or subconsciously or even consciously to some smaller degree, definitely not intentionally. Um, contributed to and uh, we squashed it that day and ever since we've been thick as thieves and I think you know I've had plenty of challenges in life and he's had plenty of challenges in life never had a challenge seeing eye to eye or backing up backing each other uh, showing up for each other thereafter even when it might have been more convenient not to and 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 in that way you know I'm really I'm really pleased with the outcome of that potentially disastrous a moment in time, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, we've talked about some of your challenges already. We've talked about your divorce and we've talked about your addiction. Well, you mentioned it and I would like to get into that um, more. So what would it be your advice for someone going through an addiction, whether that be drugs, food, sex, TV? There's so many vices that we could use to avoid, avoid having to do, avoid having to move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, what is your advice on someone? We'll start with drug addiction um, and then we can segue from there. I think addiction is an addiction. You know, it is all about sedation. You said it yourself. They're just chosen distractions, right? Um, I think some of them may have more rooted in the, in the conscious choice of intention of, of self-destruction than others. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? In yeah. the case of drugs, I'd say that probably usually is a bit higher, right? You know, um, depending upon how you entered into that funnel. Um, for me, it was a willful choice to some degree. Um, first, a distraction. For me, it was it was the facing of my first reality of loss, familial loss, was my grandparents and then my uncle. And it was a pretty disastrous series of events, you know, like my my grandmother passed away, who's like a second mother. And that really shook me because, you know, you don't, you're young, you're invincible, but you also don't have any perception, understanding of what the fact that people you love are going to leave, you know? And so, and, and then you're not ready for it and you don't honor and value the precious moments that pass until there are no more, right? Like you could have taken greater opportunity to be a better grandson, to be more present, to show up, to not be so self-centered. And, and we live in an egocentric reality in our youth, right? It, you know, as a baby, purely so. And then less and less time goes on, hopefully. Um, but but uh, the, the cascade of that event, the year to the day my grandfather passed away, and then my uncle committed suicide a handful of months later after he and I had a, a night-long conversation and, and he acknowledged his intention of doing so and you know I realized there was no way for me to, to physically or uh, stop him you know to do anything to, to like he has free will but to plead with him and, 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 and discuss with him how much he's loved and valued but it, it didn't it didn't stop any of those events from happening and I think that uh it put me in a downward spiral of what I would now consider the most dangerous state for a human to live in, which is apathy. You know, you can be angry. There's people that are angry with me that I've alluded to. You know, I'm the villain in their story. And then I talk to people and they say, well, you know, can't hate you that much if they don't love you. <laughs> you know, I was like, I get that. I, I hope that they can remove themselves from the attachment to the negative association of the energy and celebrate what we all shared at some point in time but being apathetic is so dangerous because it is the absence of care of much of anything and allowed me to do a lot of things that had seemingly only negative impact on me because i didn't associate i dissociated myself from the whole system right like hurting myself doesn't hurt these other people that I still love. And even though that love is dulled through this sedation of use of drugs or, you know, television, or you, you're de- detaching yourself from this connection, right? And, and in doing so, like removing the, that, that true human element that, that is acknowledging we are, we are, we are part of the same system, you know? And so, um, yeah, it was it was just such a such a dark and lonely time, and I think I think uh, that's that's the the thing I I would say is like you're not alone. There are no matter what you feel like, people who are going to understand what you're experiencing. If you haven't felt loved by people that you know there are still people that will love you, you know? And I think that's when we talked about like my mission and stuff like that. Like, I think our education system is a platform for this type of understanding of other humans 
in, in, way, in a way, shape, or form, and with some tools through fitness to, to facilitate the very gradual process of, of moving out of, out of that state, you know? And it's just one set of tools, and it, it just is that we are attracting people like you and people like me who, who really want to love, provide that spark of love and acceptance for other people to see in themselves what it is that they can be and to be part of that process, you know? And it, it doesn't mean that like the system does it. it, it truly loving and inspired humans that have tools and resources to facilitate an experience like that, whether it's these tools or other, others are, are, the, are the, the potential, like uh, every, every path that crosses, that, per that, that, that person crosses another human like you, or like so many that I've known is an opportunity for them to um, self select to move out of that state. And, mm -hmm. and I know, you know, um, you know, the more people that we have that are ready, willing and able and to, 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 to help, to help people on that journey. I think we have a better world that we get to live in, you know? Absolutely. And this is an interesting world that we live in with the current pandemic going on. And we talked about connection. And that's one thing I feel that a lot of people are lacking. And you're doing great things with the Onnit 6 program and the Onnit Facebook tribe, which is really like bumping and you're on there doing yeah. lives all the time. Um, what's your advice for people feeling a lack of connection? Like, what can they do? Um, because I feel that's like, a, that's an unspoken um, darkness that is happening right now. There's a lot of lack of connection. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tough. You know, I can't take a lot of credit for what meant what's been created there. I think, like I said, like we're really lucky we attract people in our education system that are are truly there to be a service. And I think we've attracted this tribe of people in through our on it six challenges, which are just a six week fitness challenge, but it's really not about well, inches lost and weight loss. It's really about like, um, just like we talk about longevity and performance in our, in our education system is about, well, how does, how did this journey impact you as an individual human being? And how has it maybe affected your family or your, your relationship? How has it maybe influenced your role or perception within your community, whether that be, you know, your city block, your, your, you know, whatever, whatever it is you consider your community or, you know, how you show up and, 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 and um, it's been pretty profound to hear how, how that works, but it all starts with, again, those concentric circles, right? You have to pour from a cup that's full. And so you have to be doing some work and then you have to find people that are doing that same work for themselves. The, the variables might be very different, but the journey is, pretty much the same as the hero's journey, right? That's your, your recurring theme. Whatever yeah. we're fighting, whatever we're overcome by, they, they sound like they're different, but they're the same big, scary beast, right? It's just that my big, scary beast relative to yours is shaped by my own experiences. They, mm -hmm. they, they look different only in description, but the, but the subjective reality of them is very much the same, right? You know, and, and um and so so like that's been the big key is that like you know these people are choosing to be part of a community of people who who aspire to be better people and are, are doing the work daily through the framework that we provide you know i'd say that they're those are the keys you know whether it's an on at six challenge or whether it's another chosen path spiritual physical you know, mental emotional whatever it is that work is on a daily basis because checking out for a day, you know, every day is a day is an opportunity. It's a cycle to, to make a choice, right? Every, every hour, every minute is another, but days are really what drive, you know, our reality. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. That's a cycle in nature. And, and, um, and making a daily choice towards manifesting an outcome and finding other people that you can resonate and discuss what the challenges from one day to the next may be and relate to such a humanizing experience and then they start hearing in other people whose circumstances are so different the same the same experience at the core 
it's not the same circumstances, but the same experience, right? And to to support each other and to and to be genuinely enthusiastic about a positive outcome for other human beings transforms not only them but us, and even more so us. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's hard to find that. So I can't tell anybody where to go to find it, but that's what you have to look for. And if you don't, if you're not getting it in the form that you know fulfills you then it's worth continuing to look for and not get pulled into things that are are, are pulling that that are you know putting you in a downward spiral versus you know helping you ascend right Mm -hmm. and to overcome apathy that arises in that process so sometimes um that will set in like you talked about how do you overcome that apathy if that sets in because they can't find that community yeah, well, you know, you can come and join up ours. That's a, that's an easy. I, we have a lot of people that join up and they don't say anything or do anything for months because they don't know. If, like, jump on in. The water is great, and you know, they get approved and and they, they just watch. You know, and, yeah. So I, I'm a people watcher too. You know, maybe maybe that's enough to inspire just a little bit of hope. Um, so I invite you and I implore you if you can't find a place to come to if you're on Facebook to come to the Onnit tribe and, and ask our admin for access. And it's okay if your participation is silent until it's your time to step into the light and be celebrated for doing so, because that is what happens. And it's really, really hard to be apathetic when people you don't even know love you for being you, for showing up and being vulnerable and are celebrating your win of just doing that, you know? That's beautiful, John. So as we move towards the end, I just have a couple more questions. Um, But this last one, or not this last one, but this question I have next is a really important one. You've been on quite the journey, uh, many trials and tribulations um, and aha moments, but what has been the biggest aha? What has been your greatest life lesson learned on your path thus far? You know, I, I I don't have any one that's prophetic or any one that's profound. I just acknowledge that the universe is in my corner, man. I, I I have been gifted time and time again things that I could never deserve, no matter what I aspire to do. And instead of guess, second guessing it, I I just um, do my best to live in the moment and take it in and you know that's a daily process that i'm still learning beautiful um so question two questions we ask everyone i'm going to ask the one taiha normally asks, um and then i'll ask mine so okay. in three words or less or in three words in three words or a phrase how would you describe your experience you're having on this earth oh um Um, three words or a phrase, a th- yes. three word phrase, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a tough, a tough thing to do in a way that that I would uh, not continue to perpetually consider thinking over and over and over again. So I think I'm getting in my own way. Yeah. uh, It could just be three separate words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Purposeful, loving light. Purposeful, loving light. Yeah, I I could could expound upon those things in, in many ways, but if I was just to allow the words that float to the surface to come out of my mouth without having to explain too much, then that's, that's an easy, uh, easy couple three. Beautiful. And um, my question, as a magician, and we all are, let's transport us into the future. And we now are in front of an 85-year-old John Wolf 
who is that 85 year old John Wolf? What does your life look like? And what is the legacy you, you have left behind? Oh man, you know, 85 year old John Wolf aspires to have some grandchildren. You know, I'm 42 right now. My oldest child, you know, is 12 now. And so, you know, I, I you know, my first biological child was, was six, right? So it's like, I was thinking like, man, I've got a long time before I'm going to have any grandbabies. Um, I didn't start re- procreating myself until my mid, mid thirties. So, you know, I, I'm in this game to win it, which is to be able to get on the ground and play like, like a child with my grandchildren, rolling around, deep squatting, crawling, and, and just to be able to enjoy a state of vitality that permits me to do that with, with, not only my children, but my grandchildren is the, is the, uh, the win I want most because I remember in, in sharing some of the dark, uh, the losses of my grandparents were, were what triggered that perpetual state of apathy. But that's largely because it was such a huge loss and the feeling of connectivity to, you know, your, 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 your ancestral line two 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 generations up where they don't they they have this pure joy in the witnessing your existence um, without the responsibility for being your full on parent hopefully most of the time right you know um, and just be able to to support love and nurture and play um, you know I think it's such a transcendent energy for a child. And so that was my experience, even though I did have my grandparents be very active in my upbringing, it, it's just very different. It's a very different thing. And so as long as I'm 85 and no matter how many grandbabies are popping out before then, that's the, that's what I aspire to. Um, and, and then the other thing is like, you know, was my legacy, you know, I think all of us feel like, our family is is a legacy, you know, right? So to be able to instill lessons, you know, there's no such thing as perfection, but like, you know, I really want the kids uh, to be better off than than with tools that I didn't have, you know. And 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 I'm really lucky because as an educator and as a leader within a community like on it, you know, you guys are not my children, obviously, but but I am able to empower people with the best tools I've been able to collect and I uh, get to witness that so like my, I'm living I'm living my legacy now especially when I get to interact with people who have been my students and teachers like you you know and so that's a uh, that's a uh, I think that's another reason why you know again I, I just feel like I'm really lucky I'm, I'm, I'm blessed every day and uh, and doesn't mean as things not, aren't doesn't mean I don't face hardships, but, but I, I try to maintain that perspective. Excellent. And we just can't leave that 85-year-old John Wolf there. So um, I want you to picture that 85-year-old John Wolf deep squatting on the floor with grandchildren running around. Picture him in your head. We're going to transport us back into the now. And in the now, that 85-year-old John Wolf sends you a message. What does he send you? He just... It says thank you. That's it. You know, like th- thank you for staying true to the path. You know that this is a. You know, I, I think. What they say, like fear doesn't. You, we talk about fear, right? Fear doesn't keep you from dying, but it sure can keep you from living. And, you know, what you've said, uh, and hopefully, what I've said about my journey, because I have no idea what I said during this whole conversation. <laughs> 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 I just open my mouth and let whatever come out, comes out, come out. But um, that uh, I think that the reinforced message is that like live, live to your greatest possibility, like right now, because right now is what it is and, and all it is. It's everything. And, uh, you know, if that manifests that 85 year old version or 65 year old version, whenever, whatever, version of me or age chronological age i end up living to i just want to be living in that purpose up to that point so yeah that's it. absolutely well thank you so much john for your time they could find you on instagram at john wolf 
Um, they could find you in the on it Facebook tribe. They could find you coaching the on it six online program. You guys are going to be releasing your six one coming out soon. Where else can they find you? Yeah. Uh, coach John Wolf on IG, which I, I need to get more active on. Right. And then and all those other places, but, um, but definitely, you know, I, I'd say, you know, Facebook or Instagram are the places that I'm most accessible outside of, you know, coming out to Austin and hanging out here, right? Uh, I thrive primarily on direct human interaction. So I'm learning uh, social media is uh, not necessarily my cup of tea in terms of my most natural state of communication. I, I tend to try to do it and then realize that it's not, it's not where I thrive, but, but it's an important part of maintaining some accessibility. So if you hit me up, I'm going to do my best to, to be available, but, but please acknowledge that it is a, it is it's something I'm still learning. Absolutely. Well, I can't wait to dance with you again in real life, but until then, let's do a digital fist bump. Bam! Boom. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time, John. Um, that's a wrap. Welcome to the winner circle, y'all. <laughs>